I know this is an exciting day, a big day today, um, holiday, and I bet that you all have uh, quite a spread ready for this afternoon's festivities. I know everybody wants to put out a good meal for Groundhog Day, right? Yeah. Now, I forgot it was Groundhog Day. Uh, it's Super Bowl Sunday, right? So you guys have your Super Bowl food ready? No? No? Usually, yeah, people get the you know get their favorites out that time. Lots of lots of chili and sandwiches and munchies and everybody's favorite snack foods and everybody's favorite stuff and pull out all the stops to make your favorites on that. Some people prefer to do it at other times, but it got me wondering: What is your favorite food? What is? I want you to stop for a second, think, and I want to know what is the best meal you have ever had? Think about it. Picture in your mind before you the best meal you ever had and think about what was it that made it so wonderful? Okay. I bet it's gonna be different for different people. Um, I've had a lot of good meals in my time, you can probably tell, um, but Two years ago, my husband took me to Yamato's, which is a fancy Japanese hibachi um, restaurant, and it, really fancy. The chef is there doing all this fancy knife work and flinging things in the air and fire flaming, and he's got all kinds of comedy routines too, squirting sake at people, and it's you know it's a show, not just a meal. It was entertainment, and it, that was a, that was up there, but I was hungry about two hours later. Uh, it was good when I had it, but didn't really uh, stick to my ribs, so to speak. And sometimes, so it was good, but eh, it didn't really keep me satisfied. I don't know, maybe some of you have thought about some of those holiday meals, not Super Bowl, but Thanksgiving or Christmas, when you get a ham and turkey and green bean casserole and potatoes and pumpkin pie. And is that your favorite? Because those, you are definitely not hungry later, right? You don't have to eat for days after those. But the problem is that that's exactly what you're going to be doing, eating for days, turkey leftovers, right? How many different ways can we make turkey? So you are. Maybe when I ask you what the best meal you've ever had is, you're thinking about church potlucks. Because then you can get a little bit of everything that you like. Right? Or the all-you-can-eat buffets, some of everything, and keep going back, and you know, just a smorgasbord. Right? Or maybe it's one of those days like today when you pull out all of your favorites at the same time. That sometimes thinks, oh, if I could just have all of my favorite foods at once, that would be the best. Something like, I don't know, for me, maybe New York cheesecake and jalapeno poppers and buffalo wings and Doritos and triple chocolate brownie ice cream. If I get all of my favorites together, I would probably have a stomach ache putting those together, right? They sound good, but put them all together and it makes you kind of sick, right? Some meals sound like a good idea at first, but afterwards not so much. And you're laying on the couch groaning afterwards or you test your blood sugar afterwards and you realize, okay, maybe that wasn't the greatest meal after all. Because a real, really, really good meal is going to do a lot of things. It's going to leave you feeling satisfied, not wanting more. It's going to be enjoyable. You're going to like how it tastes. It's going to be comforting food. It's going to be nourishing food, not junk food. It's going to provide all of the vitamins and the minerals that you need to be healthy and the calories you need to get the energy to get things done. Sometimes the best meal is not always the one you think it's going to be. And I think the disciples of Jesus discovered the same thing in our scripture reading today. And so I would invite you to turn with me to John chapter 4. John chapter 4, verse 31. And I'm going to set the stage for you just a little bit as you find it. Right before we get to this passage, Jesus has been traveling with his disciples. He's gone on a road trip. And he's been traveling from Judea to Galilee. 
and they kind of stop for a break in Samaria. And Jesus was tired, and they stopped at Jacob's well to rest. And the disciples went into town to get something to eat. And while they're gone, that's where we get in John chapter 3, we get, um, chapter 4, we get the Samaritan woman at the well. And Jesus has this encounter with a woman. And she's been an outcast, and she's got a past. But even there, despite all of that, they have a great discussion, and they talk about what real worship is, and he tells her all about her life, and he reveals that he's the Messiah, and that he is the living water. And she has this wonderful encounter with Jesus and is excited, and so she goes off to tell all of the other people in town about this man that she has just met, and could he be the Messiah? And that's when we pick up in verse 31. The disciples have come back from town from their grocery shopping expedition while the woman has gone off to tell her friends. And we start with this discussion that Jesus has been having with his disciples. So starting in John chapter 4, starting at verse 31. And it reads, Meanwhile, the disciples urged him, Rabbi, eat something. But he said to them, he said to his disciples, I have food to eat that you know nothing about. And the disciples said to each other, could someone have brought him some food? My food, said Jesus, is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Don't you have a saying, it's still four, month until, four months until the harvest? I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields. They are ripe for harvest. Even now, the one who reaps draws a wage and harvests a crop for eternal life, so that the sower and the reaper may be glad together. Thus the saying, one sows and another reaps is true. I sent you to reap what you have not worked for. Others have done the hard work, and you have reaped the benefits of their labor. This is God's word for us this morning. So I find it very reassuring that it's not just us today who get confused about what good food really is. The disciples were a little bit confused too. They offered Jesus some food and he turns it down. And he says, I have food to eat that you know nothing about. And the disciples are scratching their head and going, not to eat when you're offered food? Who does that? Why would Jesus turn down food for heaven's sake? And Jesus says, right there, that's it. It is for heaven's sake that I'm doing this. I am not talking about earthly food, and I'm passing on that because I'm talking about the kingdom of God. Jesus said, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. My food, the thing that keeps me going, is not on a plate and it's not in a bowl. It's doing what God wants me to do and completing his work. That's the best meal deal ever. And after Jesus tells them about his energy for doing God's work, he tells the disciples, hey guys, I need you to open up your eyes and look at your own jobs because the same thing is true for you. In verse 35, he says, Don't you have a saying, it's still four months until the harvest? I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields. They are ripe with harvest. The real meal deal is not just for Jesus. It's for the disciples, too. And basically, Jesus is telling them the same thing he's already told them a couple times before. In Luke chapter 10, verse 2, he sends the disciples out and he says, Look, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. He's reminding the disciples that they, too, are supposed to be about God's work. They're supposed to be ministering to people and spreading the gospel and bringing people to Jesus. And what was food for Jesus is supposed to be food for the disciples. And what was food for the disciples is supposed to be food for us, too. It is not a stretch to remind us that we had the same calling as the disciples did. And in following that task, that's where we're going to find our nourishment. That's where we're going to find our fulfillment and our satisfaction. We are confused today about what good food is, and we are just as surprised as the disciples to hear Jesus' words that the real meal can be found in part by doing God's work and by building God's kingdom. 
you don't know what real food is until you've tried what God has provided for you. Working for the Lord is one of the best meals that you can have. Now, I know that some of you inside are feeling a little skeptical about that. Working for the Lord is better than my mom's home cooking. Mm. It's better than an all-you-can-eat buffet in a five-star restaurant. Mm. Well, yes. Yes, I'm here to tell you, yes, it is better, and I've got a couple of reasons why. Working for the Lord, number one, is nourishing. Working for the Lord is nourishing. Being involved in God's work being involved in ministry is a food that will nourish you because ministering to others is about changing people's lives and we know that but usually we think that ministering to others is about changing other people's lives but more often than not the person who is changed most in ministry is the person who's actually doing the ministry it's the way we grow as Christians and the way we become more like Christ so if you want to grow in Christ, if you want to learn more about Jesus and know more about the scriptures, I have a suggestion for you. You should go teach Sunday school. You learn more not just by being a student, but you learn more by actually being a teacher. I'm guaranteeing that. I guarantee that if you ask anyone who has ever taught Sunday school, that they will tell you that they learned more and grew more as a teacher than their students did. If you are hurting, if you are in need of comfort or encouragement, I have a suggestion for you. Go do nursing home or hospital visits. I've done lots of those as a pastor, and often I'm visiting people in the hospital or at home who are going through very rough times, going through illness and times of grief, and I do it as a pastor to offer comfort and encouragement and support, because that's what pastors are supposed to do, right? But I cannot tell you how many times I have gone to minister to someone else and I've come away from a very kind of dark situation sometimes, but I have been uplifted by hearing their testimony, by seeing God's presence with them and how they are responding in the midst of trials. And I'm more transformed as a pastor by seeing them respond to God's work in their life. When we help others, when we reach out to them, we are encountering Christ. And scripture is very clear on that. Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and offer you drink? When did we see you as a stranger and invite you in or sick and go visit you? And God replies, I tell you the truth, when you did it for the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did it to me. We encounter God when we minister to others, and we are transformed. There are more vitamins and minerals for us to grow as Christians when we minister to other people than in almost anything else that you will do. So when you serve at a rescue mission, just watch as your own spirit of gratitude grows when you encounter the face of the God who's already rescued you. When you feed others, you are fed. When you empty yourself, you're the one that's going to be filled. If you want a real meal deal, if you want food that's truly going to nourish you spiritually, then you need to do what Jesus did and what the disciples did. You need to go and do the work of the one who sent you. You need to minister in the name of Christ. Now, ministering for Christ, being involved in ministry is food not just that nourishes you, but it's going to give you energy. It's going to give you power. It's going to propel us forward and push us in life. It's going to give you more energy than that little bottle of five-hour energy or a protein bar. I think a lot of times we don't think much about what it is that keeps us going in life until whatever it is that keeps us going gets up and goes. A lot of things that push us on in life have a tendency to fizzle out after a while and to crash. So ask yourself this morning, what is it that really motivates you? What is it that drives your own personal life? What is the reason that you get up in the morning? Why do you get up in the morning? Is it the promise of a paycheck? Is it a family member? Do you get out of bed because mom says, get up out of bed? Do you get up out of bed because of your children? I can't tell you how many people I know that, who say that their kids are the reason they get up in the mornings. 
Or do you get up in the mornings because you have a deep and passionate longing and burning desire to digest the word of God and feed and be nourished by him and his very existence and your faith? God, his work, his will, his word, those are the things that strengthened and nourished and sustained Jesus. What is it that drives you? Some people are driven by fame and glory and praise, and they want other people to give them affirmation when they take on a job. Some people get their energy from being in charge, that feeling of power and excitement. Some people like the special recognition that they get or the money that they get in return for their efforts. But we should be motivated by the healing, cleansing, and saving power of Jesus Christ and his will for our lives to carry out. Is that what motivates you? Is that what directs you? What is it that energizes you? Do you get your energy from a drink like I do? I will not face middle schoolers without at least two cups of coffee. <laughs> Some people choose retail therapy. They get energy and a thrill when they go shopping, go to the mall and buy something new, even if they don't need it. But God calls us to be energized simply by being refreshed in the presence of God and led by his Holy Spirit. Because I hate to break it to you, but you are going to crash when the caffeine wears off or when the sugar high wears off or when your 15 minutes of fame is up. You're going to run out of gas sooner or later if there's anything else driving you other than the will of Jesus Christ. Only by doing God's will are you going to have the sustained energy to keep on keeping on when things get tough. And that's exactly what you need to do. In order to get the full benefit of the meal that God has provided for you, you need to keep on keeping on and bringing it to completion. Because serving God is the best meal around, but only when it comes to completion. Because God's food satisfies us in a way that nothing else can. It is a superfood that truly satisfied, not just by doing the will of God, but listen to what Jesus says. He says, my food is to do the will of the one who sent me and to finish his work. Not just start with the appetizers, but to go all the way through the entire meal, all the way to the after dinner mint, right? God's work is a meal that sticks to your ribs. It's not something that you're going to eat and then find yourself hungry a little while later. It's not the fancy stuff with the big giant plates. You go to those fancy restaurants and they have a plate that's this size and in the middle there's a little bit of meat that's about this size and a few little green things around there and they drizzle some fancy stuff and that's it. No. Oh. This is something that you can really sink your teeth into. I generally prefer, and I think I read from the NIV, but I like the modern translations of scripture for the most part. I think they're more understandable. But in some cases, the King James has it right. The King James reads, my meat is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. My meat is to do God's will. Doing God's will is meat. It's something you can sink your teeth into. It's sturdy stuff. And we will not be completely satisfied with this meal of serving others and doing God's work until this meal is over, until the work is completed. We can't be satisfied until the job is done and the things are finished. I guarantee you that the best meal you ever ate was one that you actually finished, not just one that you started and ate a few bites of and then pushed aside. I'll bet you if it was the best meal you ever ate that you licked that plate clean. Completion is where fulfillment is. It's not a job that started and then kind of finished half-heartedly and pushed by the wayside. And that's what Jesus is pointing his disciples to. He says, open your eyes and look at the fields. They are ripe with harvest. Guys, the job's not done yet. The meal is starting. It's not ending. The work is not going to be completed until the harvest is complete. Until, as it says in verse 36, until we harvest the crop of eternal life. <clears throat> We have a job as Christians of ministering to hurting people, but it is not finished until they have eternal life. 
We can minister to people with all kinds of spiritual and physical needs, but it's not done until they know Jesus. We're called to a lot of different ministries in the kingdom of God. God calls us as individuals and a church to share Christ with the hurting world. But whatever form of ministry that takes, whether it's a prayer chain, whether it's diaper depot, whether it's doing a freedom school or taking kids to church camp, that job is not completed until we verbally tell them about Jesus. Whatever we do, we have to do as people who are committed to Jesus Christ. And so if we have an exercise class at church, great. We get them into shape, we get them to be healthy in mind and body, but we also need to make sure they're healthy spiritually. If we have fun youth activities, it's not just to herd kids in and to entertain them or keep them off the street or to give them an education and be the good influence on them. It's to show them life in Jesus Christ. We have to offer them the whole meal. We have to tell people the whole story. We have to harvest a crop for eternal life and bring that work to completion. Without telling people about Jesus, then feeding people at a food pantry, it's just the same as giving them a whole bunch of coupons for the grocery store. Having fun youth events becomes nothing more than glorified babysitting. They're good things, but they're not satisfying. The best meal is satisfying when you finish it. That's when it gets exciting, when you bring people to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Serving God is nourishing. Serving God is energizing and it's filling. But sometimes when we leave it at that, it sounds about as exciting as like organic whole grain and broccoli and vegetables and stuff. Oh, it's nourishing. It's good for you. Mm -hmm. But you know what? It's more than that. It really is. Serving God is more than that. I'm here to tell you that serving God is enjoyable. It is enjoyable. It is good food that's good tasting. Some people think that being involved in Christian service, whether it's going on a mission trip or cleaning the church kitchen or teaching kids or whatever it is, it's kind of a chore. All right, I will serve in the church, but only because I have to, and it's probably going to be about as exciting as oatmeal, right? That's not true. It's rewarding. Serving God is rewarding now and for eternity. We um, received a cross stitch a while back that someone had made for us. We get a lot of um, cute sayings as pastors and knickknacks from the Christian bookstore or whatever. And this was a cross stitch that someone did with um, a saying on it that says, working for the Lord doesn't pay much, but the retirement benefits are out of this world. Yeah. Now that, that's a cute saying, and, and there's some truth to it, but it is not the whole story. It's only part of the truth. Because I want to reassure you that you don't have to wait until you retire or expire to see the benefits of doing God's will. You can see it now. And that's what Jesus is telling the disciples. Even now, he says in verse 36, even now, not at the end, even now, the one who reaps draws a wage and harvests the crop for eternal life so that the sower and the reaper may be glad together. The joy starts now. What could be better than seeing people become a part of the kingdom of God? Seeing people come to know Jesus, seeing baptisms, watching them grow in the Lord brings joy. Um, I don't know how much you can tell about me, but I am not a cheerful person. I really am not. I am not an optimistic person. I am the classic glass is half empty person. My husband He's the optimist, he's the glass half full, he is full of energy, he bounces around and has got a smile on his face, and I'm the pessimist. But I want to tell you that I do smile on occasion. I smile and I have joy in my heart when I see what God is doing in people's lives. If we have a worship service where there's baptisms, I am practically giggling in the pews. I am so happy. And when I see young people sharing a testimony or singing in service, or when I look at some of the people who were some of those kids that I had in Sunday school and in youth group that I thought they're going to be lucky if they live to adulthood because they're driving me crazy. But when I see them that we, they are now young adults, 
um, seeing what they've grown into, seeing how they love the Lord, seeing that they are choosing to go to church on their own, not because their mom dragged them to that. It brings joy to my heart. It is so exciting to see the results of God at work in people's lives. It's a joy. Doing God's will brings you more joy and happiness than any happy meal at McDonald's is ever going to do. Because we do see the rewards, not just eternal life in heaven. We don't have to wait until then. We see the rewards now. And then the last thing I want to tell you is that serving God is easy. It is an easy meal to prepare. Most of the best meals that you've had, I bet you, are ones that somebody else made for you, right? Where you didn't have to do all the hard work slaving all day in the kitchen. It's someone that cooked it for you because they love you. Isn't that awesome? Jesus says, I sent you to reap what you have not worked for. Others have done the hard work, and you have reaped the benefit of their labor. I don't want you to leave here with the idea that serving the Lord and doing his work is extraordinarily difficult, or that it requires years of training and education, and that you have to go to seminary. Because God's meal is not Gordon Ramsay, top chef, cooking school stuff. It is not cordon bleu stuff. It's like heating things up in the microwave. It's easy because the Spirit has already gone ahead of you to do the hard work. We do not have to change people's hearts. We can't change people's hearts. That is the work of the Holy Spirit. We just have to share the love of Christ with people and let them respond. God has already gone ahead of us and done the hard work for us. We have the easy peasy part. Where else in life has the hard work already been done for you? We don't save people. God does. One of my very first sermons, 25 plus years ago, was the candidating sermon at my very first church. So I'm there preaching, you know, for the first time to this congregation. And it came time for the invitation. And lo and behold, someone came forward at the invitation. And I'm like, oh, wow, I am knocking this out of the park, right? My first sermon, I preach it, and somebody comes to know the Lord. Isn't that really impressive? It wasn't that impressive because even though I had somebody come forward to receive Christ that day, I also had at least two people on the other side of the church that were literally snoring. So I don't know that the sermon was so great. That was the first time. They, they, never, they didn't know me. It was the first time they'd met me. I reaped what I did not sow. There were been a whole lot of other people in that congregation that had been working with this young man. Parents, grandparents, Sunday school teachers, many people who had planted and watered and helped him to grow. And on that day, the sower and the reaper rejoiced together. It is easy to serve the Lord. It's just simple obedience to do the will of the one who sent you and finish his work. The hard part's been done. So I know you can look at your bulletin and you can see opportunities galore for ways to serve God and his kingdom. You have a smorgasbord of things to choose from, chances inside and outside the church. And I guarantee you that it will be one of the best things that you've ever done for yourself and for the kingdom of God. You will not regret getting involved in ministry and serving God. So I invite you to explore that because I want you to have the best meal of your life, to bite into the food that God has provided for you. I invite you to pray with me. Lord God, we do thank you for providing the best meal that we could ever have. Lord, we confess that so often we search for nourishment and satisfaction and enjoyment in so many other places. When really you have laid this meal right out before us. And it's only by being in a saving relationship with you. And it's only by putting ourselves right in the middle of your will and serving you that we will truly find peace and joy and fulfillment. Lord, forgive us for that. Forgive us for seeking those things elsewhere. For we know that there is a world out there that knows nothing about this food that we have to eat. So help us to go tell that world about this satisfying meal 
so that they can know what it is, so that they can know the one who is the bread of life, who is truly satisfying. Lord God, help us to serve you and to rejoice in the meal that you have prepared for us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. At this time, I'd like to invite our ushers to come forward to prepare for communion.